Cities are very often strategically located on or near vital natural resources. For obvious reasons, you want to build and concentrate people at the best spot geographically and economically. One of the most common resources that defines the greatest number of urban positioning is their access to water, primary for putting it in touch with the rest of the world through trade routes. Having bodies of water nearby can serve other functions as well. They can provide drinking water or easy mechanisms for the disposal of sewage, or the water can serve as a natural aesthetic counterpart to the man-made constructedness of the urban environment. Once the city grows along these waterways, attention develops. Civilization's need for control, efficiency, and maximum productivity can easily overwhelm a natural ecosystem's equilibrium. The resources that made a location ideal can get loved to death and end up as more of a problem than an amenity. If not carefully monitored, stormwater runoff, heat island effects, smog, destruction of animal habitats, and excessive energy consumption can add up to an ecological disaster with grave costs to the health of people and the planet at large. That's certainly been the case here in Chicago, where early techniques for taking advantage of Lake Michigan and the Chicago River by the military and industry turned the waters into reasons that people avoided the downtown entirely. It was just too disgusting and smelly. Over time, the city issued laws and removed these uses to protect these precious elements. Surprisingly, the issues developing from overuse or disregard are not directly correlated with the city's size, meaning that much of it depends on large and small-scale design decisions. Cities across the globe are embarking on experiments, testing new techniques for living with and even restoring their local ecologies. These constructions are rolling back the problematic buildings and landscapes that lead to disastrous environmental impacts. In this video, I'm going to explore a few of these in Chicago in order to reveal how this evolution can be read in the design of space by tracing the before and after of a few particularly unique spots along the shores and the banks of the city. Starting here in Northerly Island, this area used to be the home of Miggs Field, the busiest single runway airport in the world until 2003 when Mayor Richard Daly ordered bulldozers to carve giant X's into the tarmac. This area was originally one half of an embracing landscape form that celebrated and marked the termination of a major axis within Daniel Burnham's 1909 plan for the city. At the time of this plan, the City Beautiful movement was in full swing, a push to beautify American cities by borrowing from old European traditions. That include monumental boulevards and landforms that straighten out and channel natural forms and water features to iron out the complex spatial relationships of lakes and rivers in service of clarity and monumentality. This was a demonstration of civilization's ability to tame nature and subject it to our grand compositional schemes. Today, this area is a park that is deeply embedded in a process of reshaping that will continue to erode the classical outline of it for decades. While much of its original violin shape remains today, there has been a cut and fill process redistributing the land into a series of hills and a lagoon. If we compare this park with Burnham's original design, it's not that far off. The park still bears some of the visual evidence of its man-made origins. The outer shapes of the Rococo flourishes maintain the symmetry, but now the hills are geometric forms that vary the landscape on one side. However, the process I was talking about earlier, the one that is ongoing, will slowly dissolve the island's boundaries back into Lake Michigan with a series of reefs. The wetland and savanna on the southern end of the island will continue to mature and are already attracting birds and fish as well as other native species. It's also seen as a process of breaking the island down and encouraging engagement and learning. These changing attitudes can be read in the design itself, where clean edges are eroded and walls eased into gradual and layered thresholds of materials, plants, and water. My next stop is at the Field Museum, just west of Northerly Island. It's one of the largest natural history museums in the world. As such, they take a particularly keen interest in their surrounding landscape and its role in the history and evolution of the city, and even at the scale of the region of the United States. The museum originates from the 1893 Columbian Exposition, which was also designed by Daniel Burnham. In fact, all the stops on my walk today will deal with Burnham in some way or another and demonstrate the changing attitudes which have developed within the hundred year gap between their conception and then today. The original design for this area called for a series of formal lawns lined with stairs, benches, trees, and shrubs. These created strict corridors for movement and vision, drawing people and your eye to predetermined grand vistas. The plants and the grasses required constant maintenance, fertilization, mowing, irrigation, and pruning. It was a constant battle between our will to maintain a pristine synthetic construction 
and the entropic forces working to erode it into a more natural state. Now this area is dedicated to the Rice Foundation Native Garden. It's filled with plants native to Illinois, the same species that grew wild in our prairies and woodlands, transforming the area into an urban haven for butterflies, bees, wasps, birds, and other animals. Also, these plants don't require the same level of human intervention to maintain. They would have grown here anyway. The gardens are a unique site where research happens alongside educational programs. Field researchers study changes over time by analyzing soil samples, documenting the species that are found in the gardens, and tracing the effects of climate change here. The change in attitude can be read in the visual relationship between the architecture, the walking paths, and plants. Plants break down the edge of the walkways, growing tall enough to obscure our view of the classical building form. No longer is the triumphant man-made building at the center of unbroken visual axes. Instead, the interplay between crafted and natural elements are made visible and become interactive and accessible. My next stop is at Millennium Park. At first glance, it might not be clear how this space fits the same narrative. It's certainly more flashy and spectacular as a tourist attraction than it is as a landscape reclamation. But it also owes its origins to the 1909 plan by Burnham as part of the front door for the city. Of course, much of its sustainability is economic, and it generates billions of tourist dollars for the city and offers a great public space, which is certainly a challenge today. But as far as the planetary impact of its design goes, the entire park is actually the world's largest green roof at 99,127 square meters or 24 and a half acres. The entire thing is built over train tracks and parking lots. So just like Northerly Island, which used to be dedicated to transportation infrastructure, new forms of thinking have allowed us to make a public amenity out of it. And just like Northerly Island, there was a fight to change it. The entire thing was conceived as a series of outdoor rooms. It's simply too large for one design intention. Each outdoor room has its own vision, like puzzle pieces that fit into the hole. Roughly half of the park's surface is a permeable green roof, and many aspects of the site's architecture are designed to be energy self-sufficient and universally accessible. Areas like the Lurie Garden include native plantings just like near the Field Museum. These reduce stormwater runoff by 60%, or nearly 100,000 gallons annually. This eliminated the need for an on-site stormwater detention facility. Solar panels provide energy for the lighting in the park and the parking lot below, which is also heated through a process called passive solar heating. Next up on our stroll is the Chicago Riverwalk, which was only possible after a significant effort to improve the water quality of the river. The combined stormwater and sewage that used to be sent directly into the river is now funneled through water treatment plants before it is released into the river. Like Millennium Park, the walk isn't really just one thing. It's a series of different zones defined by streets. While none of these are particularly restorative in the same way as other landscapes we've seen, each does have areas for plantings of prairie grasses or trees or other plant life, and some put us closer in touch with the river than we would have been able to otherwise. In the River Theater, for instance, there are 17 honey locust trees, which are native to this area and punctuate the staircase. Root space soil cells were used to enable deep root volumes, ultimately protecting the root balls in this complex planting environment and provide the generous soil volumes that are needed. A water harvesting system collects the stormwater drained from the river theater in an underneath structure, which is stored and then supplied to irrigate the trees. At the jetty, a series of piers and floating wetland gardens offer an interactive learning environment about the ecology of the river, including opportunities for fishing, and identifying native plants. This area is not a line, but a series of fingers, which creates more surface area between the pedestrians and the river, offering more places to engage with it. There is an area just a bit down the river that delivers on this idea even further, and it's called the Wild Mile. Currently, there's a portion of it that's built as a proof of concept, with the rest of the project gaining approval just recently. As the Chicago River gets cleaner, direct access to more people becomes possible. The hope of the Wild Mile is that constructing areas for access can also make room for constructions that help clean the river even more, creating a self-reinforcing feedback loop. The Wild Mile is made up of a series of modular planters and walkways that its designers, architecture firm SOM, hope can serve as a test case for industrial shorelines across the globe. The walkways, which are also part of the modular system, float on polyethylene pontoons that are connected together and wrapped in coconut husks. These hold up sections of heat-treated pine boardwalk. The result is a walkway that ebbs and flows with the water, subtly rising and falling with the wake of boats or the wind, making you feel connected to the water even without touching it. 
These walkways are flanked with planter rafts filled with native wetland species, sedges, swamp milkweed, and hibiscus. The root systems dangle into the water to draw in nutrients for themselves, and they attract fish to feed and spawn. Below the water surface is a submerged bunker that we can't see, but it holds 100 giant floater mussels. These animals are fed oxygen by solar-powered pumps to keep them alive while they filter 365,000 gallons of water per year. The modularity of the system allows for growth and a varied edge, ultimately a much more resilient and adaptable approach than a straight line wall that you might find elsewhere on the river. While I'm not normally someone just inherently interested in sustainable design technologies, I find the evolution of urban forms and how they embody changing attitudes utterly fascinating. This transition from hard edges to layered, from clear axes and hierarchy to more enmeshed systems is clearly seen as you walk along these water's edges. Many of you noticed that I wear a black t-shirt almost in all of my videos. And to be honest, I've been searching for the perfect one ever since starting the channel. Well, I'm excited to tell you that I finally found it. It's the one that I'm wearing right now and the one that I wore throughout this entire video. And it's made by Cuts Clothing. My criteria for choosing was first that it had to be high quality. Black shirts aren't always black or they fade really fast. That is not the case with Cuts, made with Pika Pro Fabric, which is soft, retains its shape, doesn't pill, and is made to last. Next up of what's important was fit, which on this shirt is just about perfect. I'm not sure how to describe it, but it's not loose, it's not too tight, it's comfortable while looking sleek. That's also due in part to the minimal detailing and lack of branding, which is just a little X on the side. These shirts are also highly customizable to you with different collar types, crew, v-neck, or henley, and bottom hems, curved, split, or elongated. I go with the standard crew and the split hem, which is perfect for me. Now in my daily life, I don't always wear a black t-shirt and Cuts has you covered there too, with all kinds of colors to choose from, as well as other work leisure staples like hoodies, joggers, polos, and more. So get 15% off yourself by going to cuts.team slash Stuart Hicks and enter promo code Stuart Hicks. I'm about to head over there right now to pick up a hoodie for this fall. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. You'll be rewarded with thoughtful videos on the built environment every other week on Thursdays. While you're waiting for the next one to drop, check out some of these other ones. See you over there.